As far back as I can remember, I wanted to be in show business. I wanted to be a famous actor, then a famous comedian, then a famous writer, and eventually all three. You know, very attainable goals. Everything I did had something to do with working towards these goals. And I quickly learned the best way to get there was to just say yes to any opportunity that presented itself. I did musical theater. I started playing in local bands, and I produced, wrote, and performed in live sketch comedy. I taught theater to kids, started more bands, and my day job consisted of going into the crowd at the Sea Lion and Otter show at SeaWorld and messing with the audience. My plan was to throw as many darts at the bullseye as I could, and eventually one would actually hit it. My hero, Steve Martin, had tried everything as well, even magic, so I figured anything and everything is fair game, no matter how ridiculous it may appear. And in theory, that all seemed well and good. But as I got older and more ingrained in the arts, what I thought was good or interesting or even artistic made it harder and harder to just do everything and be okay with it. I was starting to develop values. <laughs> I became the guy who thought Juilliard was full of shit and spent my leisure time listening to Louis Armstrong's Hot Fives and searching for hard-to-find UK pressings of the Cure's debut record, Three Imaginary Boys. I'm a music dork and a theater snob, and the mainstream can go fuck itself. <laughs> However, when your early 20s roll around and you spend more time talking about potential rather than exploring it, things might not be going like you wanted them to. When you look deep into your loved one's eyes and can see that all they want for you is to be as good as they believe you can be, you're willing to slightly abandon those newfound values in order for domestic happiness. And maybe, just a maybe, a chance to get paid well to do something that resembles entertainment. This is how I became a radio DJ. In 2003, my then-girlfriend urged me to enter a radio contest called The Supermouth on the number one rated station in San Diego, Star 100.7 FM. The contest was an American Idol ripoff to find the next great radio DJ. The winner received a long list of prizes, including a one-year contract with Star worth $50,000. She thought not only would this be a great outlet for me, but it could also end up being a very lucrative career move. My knee-jerk reaction, like always, was to just say yes. I mean, what's one more thing for a resume that no one will ever look at? <laughs> Best case scenario, I would stay in the contest for a few weeks, plug my band the whole time, and gain some fans for the, that might support my other projects in the future. Worst case scenario, I lose immediately and nothing's changed. So I made an audition tape, sent it in, and the next thing I knew, I was in the star studio with the other Supermouth hopefuls. For eight weeks, we all had shifts on the air. Then at the beginning of every week, a panel of judges would give their thoughts. Listeners would vote on the contestants they liked, and then somebody was booted. From the start, the competition was 100% cheese. But since I didn't plan on staying long, I just decided to kind of mess around. Like during some on-air shifts, we played random games so that the listeners could get to know us better. Okay, Dallas, Sarah from Mira Mesa wants to know, boxers or briefs? <laughs> and then I reply with, well, Sarah, neither. <laughs> you know, shit like that. <laughs> and then on one of Star's monthly singles cruise, I grabbed the mic and said, All right, fellas, no means no, but hey, we're in the middle of the ocean, so where's she gonna go? <laughs> <laughs> My girlfriend thought I was deliberately trying to lose, and in the beginning, I guess I was. <laughs> but one thing became clear. Although this wasn't the kind of showbiz I wanted, it was showbiz nonetheless. And I began to try and win because I also realized that maybe I didn't always want to have a roommate. <laughs> and in the end, all my attempts of making fun of Star and snide remarks ended up being a hit, and I did, in fact, win. I won big time. What can I say? I have a trusting voice. <laughs> all of a sudden, I went from a completely broke guy who aspired to be the next Steve Martin to a weekend DJ on the most popular radio station in town. I also, now had, I also now had more money than I knew was available to someone who had pretty much dedicated his life to meta-level fart jokes. <laughs> on the surface, this seemed like a wonderful moment. Everyone in my life was so happy and proud of me, and so was I, until I walked out of the studio and a very real problem presented itself. I hated Star. <laughs> they were that radio station which exists in every city in America. The DJs talk nonstop about whatever celebrity is going out of rehab or going in or who's getting divorced, cracking jokes, much to the delight of hundreds of minivan moms picking up and dropping off their children to a dance class they long stop progressing at. <laughs> when the DJs aren't talking, they play the most uninspiring mainstream music that was charting at the time, which in 2003 was shit like Michelle Branch and Bare Naked Ladies. <laughs> I decided, since sarcasm apparently got me here, that I was going to embrace it. I mean, I despise every single piece of music Star played and every single thing Star stood for, so being a huge asshole wasn't going to be hard. 
<laughs> Not only did our philosophies crash, clash, but I couldn't in good conscience get on the San Diego airwaves and play Creed without an on-air apology before me. <laughs> <laughs> or play Christina Aguilera's monster hit Beautiful without suggesting she was a monster drug addict. <laughs> sure, I could get fired for doing this, but I won a contest. They don't fire the dude who won the showcase showdown, and they certainly never invite him back to be the next Bob Barker. This was my one-and-done chance to be the kind of DJ I had always wanted to hear and used to exist. Honest and funny. I mean, no one ever sat me down and told me what I could not couldn't do, so I just figured it was my chance to do whatever I wanted, which was mainly using Star's <laughs> airwaves to make fun of Star. <laughs> After a few months of being a 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. DJ on Saturdays and Sundays, I was asked to join the afternoon drive time show on a regular basis. Drive time happens from 3 to 6 p.m. and is the second most listened to block of time on any station in any market across the globe. Apparently, the drive time DJs loved the stuff I was doing on the weekends. They mistook my hate for dry wit. <laughs> <laughs> and they brought me in on to be the cranky naysayer. <laughs> this particular drive time show was a tag team of a 300-pound man named Greg who spent the first half of every show whining about his life and the second half yawning. His co-host and music director of Star was an impish 40-year-old woman named Jen, who spent most of her time being hungover and trying to bang anyone who could advance her career, and yes, this is the nicest way I can describe them. <laughs> <laughs> they were terrible people who complained nonstop that their job was too tasking. Being a DJ on the radio consists of sitting in a chair in front of a microphone for around four hours. You spend about 30% of those four hours talking, and the rest of the time you push buttons on a control board which is located directly in front of you. <laughs> of course, that's if you haven't pre-programmed the computer to run the show for you, which almost everyone at Star did. For Greg and Jen, this job was too tasking. <laughs> and to top it all off, all they made was a measly $70,000 a year. Well, Jen made $90,000. <laughs> However, they weren't great at the patented star on-air banter and would always generously set me up for one of my edgy takes on current events. This lasted a good two months before I started to realize that what I had hoped was me making fun of star on star, cleverly disguised as biting sarcasm, was just becoming shtick. Those bastards had figured out how to make me sound like part of the fucking team. <laughs> I didn't want to be a wacky DJ. I wanted to be George Carlin. I wanted to matter. I'd had enough. Greg and Jen brought up Ben Affleck and J-Lo's troubled marriage for the fourth day in a row. When they tossed to me for one of my takes, I just said, you know, I don't think we should be talking about this. I mean, are we just making jokes to feel better about ourselves? <laughs> Greg went to commercial and no one said a word to me for the rest of the show. The next day, my key card no longer worked. I had been fired. Of course, I had a contract, so they had to pay me the rest of the money, which was awesome. I bought a TiVo and got paid $16,000 to watch Save on the Bell for the next four months. I really had no idea what had just happened. I felt like I had done something good, something to make my indie gods proud, but what that was, I didn't know. Maybe it was nothing, and that's what made me feel like a big idiot. <laughs> I couldn't see myself going back into radio. However, around the same time I was trying to make a difference at Star, a new station was gaining momentum in San Diego called FM 94.9. It was put together by a couple radio veterans who longed for a station that reminded them of what, of what, ugh, sorry, of what was once glorious about the FM dial. Less talk, more rock, and don't just play the hits. They started a local show which only played local San Diego music and asked local musicians to come in and guest host. Since I was in several local bands in the early 2000s, I got the call and of course I said yes. I thought it might be fun to hang out at a radio station that actually cared about the music part. I guest hosted twice and they asked me to come on board as a part-time DJ. Although I still had no desire to have a career in radio, and the $15 an hour they were offering wasn't that appealing, I gave it some thought. I would get free tickets to just about anything I wanted. They did play mostly good music, and hey, they were offering. It wasn't a contest, so maybe I was actually good at this. Maybe my sarcasm and honesty had a place on the San Diego airwaves. So since my only other prospects at the time were sporadic touring and a non-profit production of Pippin, I said yes. <laughs> FM 94.9 wasn't at all like star and content, but they still played by the rules of radio. Every shift we were given a playlist with very little wiggle room to change anything. I was still supposed to do on-air promos and pretend I liked every single song the station played, which sounds easy, but any time I played Sublime or The Offspring, I began to wonder if I could last in this business. <laughs> I had made a decision to have a job that hundreds of other people would give their left leg for, and I was trying to buck up and get over my internal machismo of being an adult. However, 
I still felt a responsibility to be honest with what I perceived as a smarter audience of music lovers. I told my bosses this, and they said they totally understood as long as my honesty didn't come off as hateful, we'd have no problem. My first warning came within the first month when I played Spoon Man and informed listeners there was no way anyone actually liked Soundgarden. <laughs> My second warning came after I apologized to anyone who was offended by the playing of Sublime's music. This warning also came with a meeting, and I was told that honesty didn't mean making fun of the music and that San Diego loves Sublime, so I should tone it down. I also was quick at finding out this wasn't what I thought it was going to be like, and that was mostly my fault. I mean, radio is radio, and everyone needs to make money to survive. It's true I didn't have to deal with Greg and Jen anymore, but I did have to play Sublime, and if you can't tell by now, I fucking hate it. <laughs> I'll be honest, at this point, it's extremely hard to explain to you what I was feeling. I felt lucky to have such an easy job, but I also felt like being a radio DJ was the lowest art form around, sans being a wedding DJ. <laughs> I felt like I was being punk rock and challenging the system, but I also felt like a huge dickhead. I did feel like I was giving the listeners something different, but maybe the listeners didn't want that. I mean, at this point, shouldn't all real music fans just have an iPod? <laughs> I wanted to be funny, edgy, and different, but at 24 and 25, I didn't exactly know how to make that appealing. I had absolutely no concern that I would be fired, because the fact that I spoke into a microphone, and then thousands of people listened to what I said, did not make sense to me. <laughs> While all this was going on in my brain, I was hoping that what was coming out of my mouth would be funny. I was going to a commercial break on the local 94.9, and I was supposed to say, it's the local 94.9 supported by our friends at Miller Lite. Instead, I decided to say, it's the local 94.9, supported by our friends at Miller Lite, helping me to beat my wife since 1972. <laughs> we lost that sponsor. <laughs> a recording studio sponsored a local show, and I pointed out that they had a bad reputation for ripping off bands. We lost that sponsor. They shuffled me from time slot to time slot, trying to find a place for me, and everywhere I went, things just seemed to get worse. <laughs> then one day, I was coming out of a commercial break. The commercial was for Subway's Meatball Marinara Sub. <laughs> the song I was introing was Garbage's single Bleed Like Me, which is about female menstruation. <laughs> Seems like a perfect segue, and it was. <laughs> it's FM 94.9. Speaking of Meatball Marinara, here's Bleed Like Me by Garbage. <laughs> Immediately, an owner of a Subway franchise called the station and checked me out for calling Subway garbage. When I explained that's not what I said, and that I was actually just comparing Mariner's to... <laughs> The next day, Subway pulled all their advertising from the station, and I was suspended for a month. When I came back, my boss, Garrett, pulled me aside and did two things. He gave me an advanced copy of Ben Fold's new record, and then told me, I understand what you're going through, and trust me, we all want to get on the air and talk shit about everything and do what we want, but that's not how it works. You do not have a future in radio, but you do have a future in making people happy, and I'm not going to give up on you until you figure out what it is. You won't win because I won't let you lose. He then gave me the coveted shifts of Saturday mornings, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. <laughs> and Sunday mornings, 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. <laughs> but I never forgot what he said. He was the first professional person to ever believe in me, and that changed everything. They left me in the abyss and assumed I'd figure it out. And hiding away late at night and early in the mornings with no one to bother me and very few people for me to bother. <laughs> I finally did. My Sunday shift also started directly after local music legend John Reese's brilliant show, The Swami Sound System. We became friends and began to start my on-air shifts with impromptu talk shows about sports, music, and politics. Sometimes we talked for five minutes, sometimes we talked for an hour. No one cared. It was 1 a.m. <laughs> after years and years, I started to actually care about radio and care about what I was doing and saying. But, just like anything else, once you start to care... It all falls apart. <laughs> FM 94.9 was dying in the ratings, so they brought in a wacky morning show. The guys who helped build the station were getting fired, and worst of all, we were told in a staff meeting that our highest rated music came from Sublime, and we'd be playing them every 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the hammer had fallen. Everything was changing, and it finally felt like it was time for me to leave. But how do you quit a job you barely have? <laughs> Luckily, I didn't have to trigger it up. In 2011, along with 30% of the staff, I was laid off after seven and a half years on the air. I still get asked from time to time if I'll ever return to radio, and honestly, I don't know. It ended up being something I really enjoyed doing. Of course, if you were to tell Supermouth Dallas that, he'd probably vomit out of fear. 
but that kid also had no idea what health insurance is. <laughs> we all want to act like fucking up is the point, but really, it's just the beginning. <laughs> Super Mouth, Dallas, get off! Man.